Thank you, Dr. Yusta. <clears throat> I'd like to also add my welcome to all of you to our uh, to this wonderful course. This this is my first time, um, and and joining uh, uh, this just wonderful um, uh, list of uh, speakers and topics. Just out of my own curiosity, can I just have a show of hands? How many of you are interested in heart failure or think that you may be taking the heart failure boards down the road? Okay, well that's good. How many of you have clinics right now, maybe as a resident or as a fellow, that you are seeing heart failure patients? Okay, so as I thought, no matter what you choose to do in cardiology, you cannot avoid heart failure. It will follow you no matter how hard you try to escape it. Um, okay. I think, hold on a second. All right. So I know um, Dr. Brown did a wonderful job in just touching the, the very vast compendium of, of uh, information that has come out of in the world of heart failure in the past 10, 15 years. Um, you can have literally a whole week of session or, and, and, and lecture and discussion just devoted to this topic. What is really a wonderful guideline for all of you, and I would very much uh, recommend that you read it or at least look at the executive summary, is the 2013 guidelines. It really has the, the, the um, take on points, what you need to know for your practice, and, and what is now considered the, uh, the best option in patient care. So I've just dumbed it down and summarized it here for you. What is new in this, in this 2013? They really do highlight the class one indication for um, heart failure uh, patients, emphasizing the validated uh, risk scores, as was briefly mentioned, and also uh, importance of education. And I think this is one area that we really have not paid due diligence, how important education is and how important social support is. And of course, it, it ties into with, with economy of heart failure, Again, this is another topic, but there is now a movement towards hoping to uh, get that better in the years to come. Um, broad, uh, broader uh, indication for the adaptor antagonist and updated uh, uh, device therapies. Okay, I don't think I'm doing this right. How do you advance? Okay, oh, no, I found it. Okay, uh, this, was, uh, this was already reviewed, the definition of heart failure. I'd just like to add that there is a segment, all by small, on diastolic heart failure. We've heard this, various names, various terms, preserved heart failure, uh, HFPF, what have you. But what they ha all have in common is these are the patients that arrive at your office, either deminous, short of breath. When you look at their echo, they really look not that you know, different. They look essentially normal. But their quali quality of life is, is poor, and they're symptomatic, and they often require multiple hospitalizations. Studies have shown that for these patients, the outcome is as detrimental uh, as systolic heart failure. Unfortunately, we do not have any evidence-proven uh, treatments that has shown to be beneficial for this larger group of cohorts. So this, um, uh, uh, this guideline does really a good job in touching on this a little bit and, and letting you know that for this patient right here, the improved um, greater than 40% EF, this, this is the population that might have had an ejection fraction of 25%. You did a great job in putting them all the right drugs, and now they've gotten better. But they have a, a, a phenotype that's different than the, the patients uh, who started out with just uh, a, a normal uh, LV function. So just be aware of that. I won't go through this again. Uh, the pathophysiology of heart failure, I think, is well known to all of us. The bottom line is there is an upsurge of uh, this neurohormonal antagonism. Short run, it's good. Long run, it is bad. And long run, we all know what it does. It remodels the left ventricle, right? Study after study after study from sub-analysis. Uh, uh, this is from the SAVE study. This is from the, uh, one of the Augusto study. Whether it is dilated cardiomyopathy, whether it's a post-MI, if your heart is enlarged, it's worse. And, and that's, I think, something that we have all learned to appreciate. And what, what of course, um, um, has been shown over the years is that whatever it takes, whether it be medical therapy, whether it be device, that can restore the, the, uh, the damage done by the, uh, the remodeling is what you're after. We have done a lot in the past 20-some years with our drugs. And, and um, if you look at sort of the compendium of the improvement, it, it's quite remarkable. With ACE, ACE inhibitors alone in the 90s, about 28% reduction in mortality, 
add a beta blocker, you have additional 34%, and of course, aldosterone blockers, additional 15%. So altogether, a, almost a uh, cumulative 60% decrease reduction in mortality. I don't think there, are, there is that many uh, other disciplines within medicine with chronic disease that can tout that much of an improvement. And of course, we have seen that not all drugs have been, have been uh, beneficial. Um, there have been other therapies that, that has been tried, TNF-alpha blockers, ET1, um, and then some others that really have demonstrated that there is no benefit and some actually has sh shown to be harmful. And, and this has, uh, of course, uh, produced the, the, the active discussion. Is there a ceiling effect? It, how much neurohormone antagonism can you provide and can you give without, uh, without you see the, the trend or the, um, the outcome measures going the other way? And so this is, I think this is something that we need to keep, uh, we need to keep on top of our heads when we look at other newer approaches to uh, treatment for heart failure. The etiology on prognosis is also important, whether you have ischemic, non-ischemic, peripartum, infiltrative, and even among the infiltrative, we now know that whether it's sarcoid, amyloid, or hemochromatosis, the long-term outcome is very variable. And now with the um, wonderful uh, um, advent of cardiac MRI and how useful that is in trying to get a better handle on this, of course, we are very aggressive on chasing this with a biopsy to arrive at the exact diagnosis because, of course, um, how you approach that patient will, di will differ whether it's sarcoid or amyloid. And I know you're going to have a talk with Dr. Estep about this uh, in a little bit. So t just to touch upon the stages and phenotypes, stage A, B, C, and D, and I'm, I'm sure you, you know all this by heart. Um, stage A, high risk for heart failure, but without structural heart uh, disease or symptoms. These are the patients that walk into your office and you can see that they ha their blood pressure is not optimal, uh, they have diabetes, they, have, they are somewhat obese. Risk factors, and we talk about risk factors a lot. But you, at the end of the day, you know, this is where you, you as a physician and you as a cardiologist can make the, the greatest and long-lasting really um, uh, impact on that one person's life. Have an earnest discussion about what this means 5, 10, 15 years down the road because when they hear from you, it really does carry a, a significance rather than hearing it from their friends or on the TV and so forth. So I think stage A, this is where I think we can make the greatest impact as a medical community. Stage B, they already have some structural damage, uh, but they don't have any signs or symptoms of heart failure. So these are the ones that had a had MI, um, have some um, LVH and a little bit of a EF, but they're functional class one. They really are, not, are doing well. The vast majority of the, the outpatient arena is here, stage C, where they have structural heart disease and they have either prior or current um, heart failure symptoms. NYHA class, this was already reviewed to you, so I won't belabor this. Just to note that, again, as it was stated, the stages of heart failure and, and, uh, and NYHA class, they do complement. They do not replace one another. And, um, as, and with the stages, you can only go down. You cannot go up. Whereas with a functional class, you can do both depending on how you do. Okay, the other thing that uh, I think this, some of this is, is touched upon in, in, in the boards to some degree is just know your recommendations. A class one, 2A, 2B, and of course class three is contraindicated, and, of, and the, uh, the certainty of treatment effect, what level A, B, C means, and what it means when you make the decisions for, for your uh, patient care. So stage A, this is the high risk for heart failure, no structural heart disease, no symptoms. What they recommend is hypertension, lipid disorder, uh, should be addressed and then controlled. And, and also obesity and diabetes, tobacco use, what you can intervene and, and talk to the patient about as an active intervention should be also addressed. Uh, this is stage B. As you can see, uh, this is now we're seeing ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, statins. They all have a uh, um, recommendation of, of, uh, of one. And an ICD here for asymptomatic ischemic cardiomyopathy patient, at least 40 days at post MI, EF of less than 30%, and on good uh, guideline recommended therapy. So for stage three, um, out of interest of time, I'm not going to go through the, all the uh, uh, really wonderful done studies and accomplishments in the past few decades. Just to highlight a few, the SOLVE study, this came out in 1991, 
And, and it's hard to put in words what this actually um, study did for the cardiology, heart failure community, and medical community. One, it was a landmark study in so many ways in that it, de it demonstrated a significant uh, decrease in, in um, um, mortality with medical intervention. And also, it started the shift of paradigm and how we looked at heart failure. Uh, and so this was an, an incredibly exciting time. I think I was a resident about this time when this came out. And we had journal club after journal club just dissecting every minutia part of the soft treatment and the, uh, and the, uh, the study uh, 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 details. Prevention arm, this, this is for the patient population that uh, had LV dysfunction but really was uh, asymptomatic. Again, demonstrating that while there was no mortality benefit, what you did was you, um, uh, there was a, a significant change or improvement in the progression of heart failure. Again, never too early to intervene when it comes to uh, CHF. Dose. Dose, we talked about this a lot and touched upon some. This is the ATLAS study, and, and, and some of this uh, will creep up at, at some point, I know, as you prepare for your um, other studies. It does show that if you look at here, that um, higher dose did better. But, you, that, but there's a lot of uh, um, discussion, and this is actually quite controversial, whether this is really true. Uh, if you look at the effect on the uh, perfusion, renal, particularly symptomatic, and also how this uh, limits your ability to uptitrate your other therapies. There are also other, other studies that was as well done that show that even low dose ACE inhibitors is as beneficial. So I think I just mentioned this knowing that um, uh, this, is a, this was a, uh, a sort of a, a important studies on its own, but just be careful about the uh, final interpretation. So the ACE inhibitors and ARBs, um, recommendation A, it needs to be started. ARBs, those who are ACE intolerant, absolutely. And also those um, uh, who are taking ARBs for other reasons. There is a strong um, uh, warning against a routine use of ACE, ARBs, and aldosterone antagonists, which is potentially harmful. I think this is repeated about three to four times or even more throughout the whole guideline. Again, be very, very careful on using um, uh, these combinations of, of drugs, and it's contraindicated. Even using an ACE and an and, uh, aldosterone antagonism in an elderly diabetic, you really have to be careful, even those that have a deceptively normal looking creatinine. Beta blockers, another uh, game changer. Um, throughout the uh, 90s and, and, uh, early, and early part of 2000, we've had a compendium of, uh, of uh, really landmark studies, Carvedilol, uh, CBIS with Bisoprolol, Mayor Heart Failure, Copernicus with Carvedilol, demonstrating an incredible rate of mortality benefit. And, and I think uh, this will demonstrate the full swing in how, again, we were thinking about heart failure. Back in the 70s and 80s, heart failure was a hemodynamic uh, uh, a disease. You improve the numbers that you see in the swan, you will get the patient better. So the, the push was to get the cardiac output better, to get you know, numbers looking better. Of course, that didn't pan out. And, and if you um, ever sometimes have a time and want to go back historically, you can see in the 60s and 70s all of these arguments that, uh, that, that uh, clinicians had, some stating that beta blockers should be used and a majority of people saying that this is malpractice and what are you doing, you're killing patients. There's really a lot of uh, interesting debate that went on. Well, 30 some years later, we know what you know that you know beta blocker is a for, forerunner uh, for your patients if you want to get them better. Of course, uh, all three beta blockers can be should be used as early as possible. Of course, the only caveat is if you have somebody really who's marginal, blood pressure is 85 to 90, and and and, and they're sort of hanging on by uvolemic thread. Uh, those are the patients that you really need to be very very careful and always remember that um, um, you do have time. And that little is better than none. So I always believe that it is, it is better to start, start somebody on a tiniest bit of beta blockers and then taking it very, very slow um, and with close follow-up so that they, you minimize the chance that they'll decompensate and come back to you in the emergency room. Because that will happen, and you'll, you'll run into this um, some, somewhere in your practice. Okay, um, I'm not going to belabor this. I'm, I'm sure that you all know the difference between the two drugs. Um, aldosterone evaluation, a RAL study, again, another landmark study. Uh, this study came along about at a time where uh, there were a lot of negative trials, one after another in chronic heart failure. And, and this 
came as a really huge disappointment because, you know, after all the um, ARB trials, ACE inhibitor trials, beta blocker trials, you know, we were sort of getting used to the idea, you know, we really can keep on making these amazing increments. And then we hit a break, um, and with all the negative studies. So this sort of broke that barrier in a way where we, had, we were shown that there was a yet another pathway that will uh, markedly improve the outcome. And this was RAL study. Um, you can see the exclusion criteria with the creatinine and potassium. Uh, 25 milligram a day was used, and the drug was held for obvious reasons, hyperkalemia and worsening renal function. And, and b based on this study and the Eph uh, Ephesus study, the uh, um, indication is as follows from uh, MYHA class two to four. And you could see the creatinine should be um, less than 2.5, and, and there's a really strong indications and guidelines. In the end, I think that being very, very cautious with close follow-up, one week uh, BMP check, and, and another one for two weeks or one month, and, and serially after is really important so that the patients can get the full benefit without, um, uh, without having the uh, suffering from hyperkalemia and other things. Um, uh, again, another, uh, uh, another uh, sort of warning uh, using this drug with renal function and the AHEF trial uh, for the African American patients who was noted not to receive as much benefit from ACE inhibitors. So the ACE inhibitor, so hydralazine and, and uh, isodeal combination was added and, and with uh, demonstrating a very significant benefit. So based on this, the combination of, of hydrolysis and isodil is as a very strong indication. Also, as we often use, even in, in all the heart failure population, is utilizing them for patients with renal insufficiency. And the ditch has a uh, beneficial for um, decreased hospitalization, a kind of a middle of the road um, indication. And a coagulation, this always tends to be a hot topic. Patients that have chronic heart failure and another indication, whether it's permanent, persistent, paroxysmal AFib, and an additional risk factor for cardioembolic stroke, elderly, diabetic, prior stroke, and what have you, definitely you have to anticoagulate them. Which agent you use, whether it is warfarin or one of the newer agents, actually that is a, um, that's a, another discussion, but either way, you can use um, any of the agents. Now, the chronic anticoagulation is reasonable if you just have somebody with LV dysfunction and AFib, whether it's persistent or paroxysmal. But if you have no other indication, uh, anticoagulation is contraindicated. So LV dysfunction alone, per se, it is not an indication for um, anticoagulation. These are some of the uh, 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 grade C, do not do kind of page. Um, again, the, you can see the same one here, hormonal therapies, um, not recommended. Calcium channel blockers as a first line uh, uh, regular routine use, not recommended. Uh, for preserved heart failure, I put in this just to demonstrate that there isn't much uh, recommendation, unfortunately, for this uh, disease that affects so many people, but there are active uh, investigations that are currently being looked at to hopefully uh, have some more evidence-based guideline for this. Device therapies, I think I'm out of time. Um, the ICD is recommended for primary prevention and secondary prevention for those who meet the criteria of 40 days post-MI, EF of 35% or less, and, and NYHA class. I'll just, I'll, I would just like to point out that there is an active discussion in the guidelines of utility and, and benefit of all of these devices for those who have recurrence of heart failure emission, those who are functional class three, bordering on four, whether um, putting a device in them is the, the, the right thing to do. Same thing with TR CRT, whether they have a left, left bundle or no, not left bundle, um, and, and maybe consider for patients with EF of 30% or less, um, sinus rhythm and, uh, and, and, and functional class one sy symptoms. Again, here, CRT is not recommended for patients with uh, uh, functional class one or two and non-left bundle and not indicated for patients whose comorbidities and or frailty limit them and with a less than one year of, of expected survival. This is, a, this is actually, I think, a really good um, um, sort of a, a table that puts all of the indications together, surmising all the um, uh, recommendations from probably about uh, 12 or 13 studies. So I think this is a really good tool for you. And this is, this is, again, putting in all of the things that we just discussed, including the goals of therapy. And you might ask, you know, do these really measure, measurements work? And the answer really is yes. 
because one of the latest um, uh, evaluations shows that there is a significant, again, a decrease in um, uh, mortality if you compare addition of all the uh, guideline-directed treatments. So with that, I will conclude my talk, and thank you, and good luck. Thank you.